1966, Seymour Papert, a researcher at MIT, proposed the Summer Vision Project, an attempt to use our summer workers in the construction of a significant part of a visual system. Almost 60 years later, we are still working to extend this student summer project as part of an interdisciplinary field that has come to be known as computer vision. The objective is, in effect, getting computers to see. It is a wonderful goal. In this video, I will give a short introduction to some of the tasks that researchers in this field focus on tackling. Computer vision draws inspiration from the capabilities of biological vision systems. To give a sense of how evolution has tackled this engineering problem, here is a colourful model by Thorpe and Faberthorpe of the vision pathway of the monkey, a close relative of humans. In this model, the monkey is performing a categorization task, such as choosing whether an image looks more like a dog or a cat. The processing begins with a visual stimulus reaching the retina, where, after 20 to 40 milliseconds, it is relayed onto the lateral geniculate nucleus, taking a further 10 milliseconds. From here, the signal is sent to an area known as V1, where initial processing of simple visual forms, edges, and corners takes place. The signal moves next onto V2 and V4 in the ventral pathway, where intermediate visual forms are processed, and then onto the posterior inferior temporal cortex and anterior inferior temporal cortex, where high-level object descriptions, faces, and objects are processed. This then maps to the prefrontal cortex, a site for categorical judgments and decision-making, then the premotor cortex and primary motor cortex, responsible for motor commands. Now there's a journey taking perhaps 20 milliseconds to the motor neurons of the spinal cord, and finally out to the finger muscle that implements a response. This glorious orchestra of information processing can take place in as little as 180 milliseconds, but more typically takes up to 260 milliseconds. Computer vision starts from the observation that biological vision, and human vision in particular, is a remarkable thing. And wouldn't it be great if we could replicate this form of sensory perception using a computer and a camera? Clearly, the answer is yes but it turns out to be very difficult. This is in large part due to the fact that vision is what's known as an inverse problem. Our task is to deduce something about the world around us, its three-dimensional scene structure, objects, and properties, given a set of only two-dimensional observations in the form of images or video. We do have a trick up our sleeves though. As you may sense from the colourful diagram on the left, the biological vision systems we observe in nature are fantastically complex. Building them, neuron by neuron, would be very difficult. Our strategy will be to try to steal good ideas from nature, but we are not forced to replicate the implementation details. Instead, we'll try to design algorithms that are well suited to modern silicon and camera technology. We'll begin, as it is often helpful to do, with asking ourselves what we are doing. What does it even mean to understand an image or video? Consider this example, and let's take a moment to ask ourselves what kinds of questions an intelligent research assistant or algorithm might be able to answer about this image. Some examples include, what kind of scene are we seeing? Where might the photo have been taken? What objects does it contain? How many of those objects are there? How are those objects, in this case wildebeest, interacting? Can we describe these interactions in words? A significant area of active research in our field simply focuses on trying to work out what the right questions to ask are. So, if you have any creative ideas for new questions, you may already be on the verge of publishing a computer vision research paper. There is fairly broad agreement that computer vision involves computers and some form of image data. However, beyond this, there isn't a single universally accepted framework or taxonomy that defines the field. Instead, there is a diverse array of tasks that are studied from different perspectives. That's for several reasons. The first is that computer vision is a highly interdisciplinary field that draws on ideas from neuroscience, machine learning, psychology, signal processing, and many other fields. The second is that the technology is evolving at what can at best be described as an absurd base. And so the tasks that can be tackled are also evolving. To make things concrete, we'll start by looking at some foundational, widely studied tasks. I'll begin with image classification. The objective is to assign what we call a class label to the whole of an image. You start from an image, feed it to a classifier, 
which then estimates, in this case highlighted in green, which class the image belongs to. The classes are defined by you. They are simply a finite list of discrete categories that you have decided your classifier should care about. As an example, given this image and a classifier model that has been trained to recognise animals, the job of the classifier is to tell us that this image contains a koala and not a fox, elephant, tiger or crocodile. Our second task is image retrieval. Here, our objective is to rank a pool of images according to how well they match a query. So the inputs to the model are a query image and a pool of images that we want to search through. These are each fed into a retrieval model which produces a ranking among the image pool according to how similar each image is to the query. For example, suppose our query image is a beautiful gazelle and we want to find other gazelles amongst this pool of images. We feed both the image and the pool to a retrieval model and its task is to rank the image in the pool that also contains a gazelle above those containing anteaters or this colourful armadillo. Although the example image pool has four images, modern algorithms can search through billions of images in a fraction of a second. Next, we have object detection. Your objective here is to both locate and classify objects within an image. The image is passed to a detector which outputs a set of spatial regions and their corresponding classes. Let's look at an example, this time with polar bears. The task of the detector is to process this image and to determine both the locations of the animals and assign them the correct class label. Adorable. The fourth task I'll describe is called semantic segmentation. Your objective is to assign a class label to every pixel location in the image. Starting from an image, a semantic segmenter will produce an output that is the same size as the input and at every pixel it gives a class label. The name semantic segmentation comes from the fact that you are effectively segmenting the image into regions and giving each region a class label. One use case is to segment medical images for further analysis. Another is for more general image understanding. Here we are segmenting the horse and the rider into separate regions. The next task, instance segmentation, is simple to grasp once you understand object detection and semantic segmentation. You effectively combine them. So, the task is to detect, classify and segment objects in the image. Given an image, the instance segmenter aims to find the objects, classify them and segment them from the background. Let's observe an instance segmenter in action on a few different images to see the results. We can segment zebras, frisbee players, elephants and crowded street scenes, all to a fairly high degree of accuracy with modern computer vision. Next, we have action recognition, where your objective is to take in a video sequence and predict the dominant action. So, given a set of frames from a video, an action classifier predicts a single class, exactly like an image classifier. For example, given the video on the left, an action classifier should predict show jumping as an appropriate action category. Next, we have mask tracking on video. The objective here is given a mask covering an object, update the mask to ensure it keeps covering the object across frames. So here we have a sequence with the first frame labelled, and the job of the mask tracker is to update the other frames with the mask by following the object. Let's see examples. Given only labels from the first frame, we can track a swan, some sheep, a jellyfish, a horse and rider, a dog, and whatever it is that this thing is. Next, image captioning. The objective here is to provide an accurate text description of the image. So, given an image, the captioner aims to produce a text caption describing the image contents. To make this a little less abstract, a captioner is tasked with producing descriptions like the man at bat readies to swing at the pitch while the umpire looks on, and a large bus sitting next to a very tall building. This may seem like a lot of tasks, but we've only scratched the surface. Beyond those I've mentioned, there are many, many more. We have tasks related to image processing. Examples include image denoising, in which an initial image has been exposed to some kind of noise, and our task is to remove the noise to recover the original image. Some widely studied variants of this task include super resolution, where we start from a low resolution image and aim to enhance it to a high resolution image, and image in painting, where we have corrupted regions of an image and we aim to paint over these corrupted regions with content that is consistent with the surroundings. More recently, we also have image outpainting, 
where we start from an image and then try to produce a larger version that expands it in a manner that is consistent with the original. Another focus has been on feature extraction, where the goal is to find some useful representation of an image that will enable downstream tasks. This often, though not always, begins with feature detection. For instance, taking an image and extracting the edges in it. Building on these detected features, there has been a lot of work on handcrafted descriptors, which take an image and construct some kind of descriptor, of which perhaps the best known is SIFT, that will allow us to reliably re-identify the same objects even when viewed from a different angle or under different lighting conditions. With the rise of deep learning, these descriptors have been transitioning into deep features, which also start from an image, but extract features using a deep neural network that has been trained to perform some related task. It may not be immediately clear why extracting features is useful. You can see that it doesn't make much sense as a goal in itself. The reason it is widely studied is largely because it forms a valuable building block for other tasks. We then have more fine-grained estimation tasks like human pose estimation, where we start from an image of people and we try to estimate the locations of joints that determine their pose. We also have tasks for motion analysis and tracking, like optical flow estimation, where we are given two consecutive input frames in a sequence, and our goal is to estimate the 2D motion that has taken place between them. Does it end there? No, it does not. Another big topic is 3D vision and scene analysis. This includes tasks like depth estimation, where we take in one or more images and aim to estimate a depth map, a task that is crucial in self-driving, as well as ambitious tasks like 3D reconstruction, where vision algorithms are used to build a 3D model of a scene. We have high-level vision tasks like open-ended visual question answering, where we are given an image and a question like what is shown in the photo. Our task is to provide an answer. Clearly, what is shown here is a man and a chicken. Easy. Then there are tasks like emotion recognition, where we aim to estimate the emotional state of an individual. One topic of growing popularity is image synthesis, particularly text-to-image generation, where we take in a description like an oil pastel drawing of an annoyed cat in a spaceship and try to produce an appropriate image. That cat does look annoyed. He is not to be crossed. There are also topics like style transfer, where we aim to combine a source image with a given style to create a novel result. Skipping over a myriad other domains, I'll jump to video synthesis, which is currently something of a to-do for the research community. There are a lot of active efforts here, particularly on generating videos from text, but there is still, as of April 2023, a long way to go until this can be done at high fidelity, at least in a flexible manner. In the video description, you can find links to slides and references. I hope you have a wonderful day.